Professor Ditien, many legends have developed around Pythagoras. We also have the lives written by Porphyry and Jamblikos. Could you explain how these legends were reconstructed? And what facts do we know about Pythagoras and his life? Oui. Alors, Pythagore est un yes, Pythagoras is a personage shrouded by legends and mysteries. mysteries. As far as historical data are concerned, our knowledge about him is limited. And this has to do with the nature of his person as a philosopher. He is a philosophical figure who embodies a whole series of dimensions we would today call mystical. In light of his relations with a certain number of beliefs, his relations with Apollo, and the great importance of the type of philosophical life he proposed, what we would nowadays qualify as religion or mysticism. Therefore, the biographical data as such can only be reconstructed by cross-checking the references to be found throughout ancient writing. And Pythagoras is a personage actually known above all through a sort of hagiography, through a somewhat pious presentation of it, but which also pertains to the very nature of the relationship he entertained with his followers. And it was only much later authors, such as Jamblikus and Porphyry, who put together for us a literature which is much older, much older since, let's see, Aristotle in the 4th century, and then Aristoxenes of Taranto, 
the theoretician of music, who not only had access to information and works, but had written books on the Pythagoreans, on Pythagoras himself and his scientific discoveries. Moreover, through Aristotle, and also thanks to Plato, and to a certain number of even earlier witnesses, we can trace a sort of historical identification of his presence in certain places, his political work and some of his discoveries, or at least the thrusts he imparted to science, music and astronomy. You have mentioned many aspects of this very complex personage, for example, the religious aspect. This is a very important facet. Could you explain the relations between Pythagoras's doctrine and Orphism? Yes, it's true that Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans, the people who were going to live according to the style of life defined by Pythagoras, had contacts and relations with what is called Orphism, or rather with the people who lived according to the rules laid down by Orpheus in a certain number of books. The 6th century BC was a period of great tension great changes, and also all kinds of inventions. In this century, there was also a series of movements we would now call more or less religious, and they had relations with one another. There was the phenomenon of Dionysianism. Dionysius played an important role in the transformation of cults and in the way of considering relations with the deities. And the phenomena of possession were quite important at that time. Then there was the doctrine rotating around Orpheus and the books written by Orpheus, of which we now have a series of fragments, especially in Thessalonica, in Derventa, in Greece. The oldest Greek book was found, and it was an Orphean book which a follower of Orpheus had brought with him to place upon his breast as a viaticum for his journey into the hereafter. And at the same time, in Magna Grecia, where equally important discoveries have also recently been made, we have a whole series of documents called the Golden Lamellae, which include messages addressed by those who are initiated to the gods guarding Hades. Well, Pythagoreanism does have relations with all this, relations with Orphism, relations with certain aspects of Dionysianism, and therefore relations with the mysticism which somewhat tinged all religious attitudes at that time. However, Pythagoras chose a pole, and that pole was Apollo. In other words, Pythagoras was a personage who was effectively part of his legend and who exploited what his name stood for. Pythagoras comes from the name borne by Apollo of Pythos, the Pythian, and therefore he was the one who spoke. Agora, the Agora being the place where people spoke the one who spoke in the name of Pythia. This is one of the ways this name may be read, and it is a name which already evokes a history, which harbors a history. In the first Pythagorean legend, there was going to be this very close relationship between Pythagoras and the god Apollo. He was to be Apollo's envoy, particularly in his activity, which was both religious and political, because Apollo of Delphi was also the great deity of colonization. For the Greeks, colonization didn't just mean to seize lands belonging to others. It also meant the creation of new cities. And between the 8th and the 6th centuries, the Greeks continuously invented new forms of cities, particularly in southern Italy and in Magna Grecia. So these lands were open to the action of Apollo, and the Greeks called his godly action Archegete. He was the god founder of the colonies. He was the god who organized space. 
He was the God who defined the way men were to live together. Therefore, between the Pythagoras, who came in the name of Apollo, and the Pythagoreans, and Pythagoras himself, who were to found new cities, there was a close relationship, and the two realms, religious and political, went together. This reference to religion, this reference to Apollo, is on one hand rather traditional. On the other hand, we know that as regards the religious side of their lives, the Pythagoreans were also rather radical reformers. I'll just take the example of sacrifices. It's well known that they refused to make sacrifices and were vegetarians. Could you develop this aspect which we find rather interesting? Yes, in their ways of life, in the way the Pythagoreans dressed and in the way they ate, there was something which set them apart and made them a bit different from others, because they were very serious in their thinking. They did not eat like everyone else, and they also lived together in communities. And they founded groups and were soon referred to as comrades, a sort of club, and defined as being a sort of very active political group, a sort of part. Pythagoras therefore played an important role along with Orpheus, in the reform of nutrition. Now, why was nutrition so important? Well, because in the Greek world, political relations, relations between people, were inseparable from the customary practice of a blood sacrifice. In order for the Greeks to entertain relations with the gods, and there was no political activity without a relationship with God, the invisible and the supernatural were part of the organization of the world. It was necessary to make a sacrifice. The people sacrificed living beings, letting the blood flow and eating the flesh, offering part to the gods and keeping the most important part for themselves. And let's say the Orpheans and Pythagoreans, who were religious reformers, found this nutritional practice this way of eating to be extremely distasteful and repulsive. And this was because when meat is eaten, a living being is killed. And there is no real distance or difference between ourselves and animals. Living beings are made to love one another and not to eat or devour one another. And therefore their obsession with the blood spilt their anguish caused by a blood sacrifice was present in the circle of Apollo, the sects, and the entire movement of mystics. And it was very important because of the close relationship with the blood shed in conflicts among men. And blood is blood. Blood calls for blood. As a result, especially among the Orpheans, who were total vegetarians, but also among some Pythagorean disciples, called the pure ones, who were also complete vegetarians, there was a refusal to practice this initiatory violence, which entailed killing life in order to nourish oneself. Alongside the attempt to purify the soul, the movement of the Pythagoreans, as we have seen, had very marked political interests and devoted itself to achieving political reforms. Nonetheless, this political aspect raises some problems since, as we know, the Pythagoreans were expelled, were killed, and this could be explained by the fact that on one hand they sought political reforms while on the other hand, they led a life quite different from the norm. And, as you said, were a sort of club. Could you tell us what were their exact political aims and how it's possible to explain this dual nature of club and political party? <laughs> 
Oui. Il y a, en effet, une dimension de purification. Yes, in effect, there was a dimension of self-purification, of thinking and of intellectual effort through a whole series of scientific practices which we shall discuss. However, what characterized the Pythagoreans was their always being in the plural. Pythagoras created a group of men, and he had disciples who had very close mutual relations. In other words, these disciples began by abandoning their possessions to the Pythagorean order, and a famous Pythagorean saying was, everything is common among friends. People divested themselves of their possessions, their houses, they left their homes. It was like a religious order, and entered an order both religious and martial at the same time, as we shall see. So there was this entry into the Pythagorean discipline, which applied from very early in the morning, when people gathered to consume what we would call breakfast, and to listen to a lecture on a certain number of precepts. All the hours of the day were scheduled for exercises which could be either bodily exercises or intellectual exercises. And right up to the end of the day, the Pythagoreans ate, lived and spoke together. The doctrine, or the teaching of Pythagoras, had a complete hold over the followers. The political side of Pythagoreanism emerged quite evidently in the behavior of Pythagoras when he reached Magna Grecia, after leaving Samos, after abandoning Samos as a result of a tyrant, we are told, because of a form of tyranny which he considered an obstacle to the orderly running of the city. When he arrived in Magna Grecia, and in particular when he reached Croton, that is where things began for him, he started delivering speeches, a talk for children, a speech for women, an address to the populace, in order to make them understand they had to alter their lives, they had to change their ways. So Pythagoreanism involved a very important reformation dimension. Pythagoras actually did put into practice reforms which worked with a certain number of disciples. Once they became known and people heard them speak, these disciples did give the impression of being a club. People who stood out by the way they ate together in canteens, just like soldiers, by the way they did their training, and training to wage war as well. It was necessary to have a body able to react to attack and aggression, and also in their intellectual discipline, and various types of conversation dealing with subjects on the program. Hence, there was a sort of commitment of the entire person in the Pythagorean order. And we know that when troubles and serious problems arose between the city of Croton and the large, economically powerful city of Sybaris, the Pythagoreans took the initiative and pitched their forces against Sybaris. And that was the same time when they sought to assume complete control over Croton. Pythagoreanism's ambition was to reform the city of men completely, and not to abandon the world like the Orpheans, who deserted politics and were interested in neither social transformations nor political relations. Everything was rotten. It was necessary to give up this world, to forsake it. The Pythagoreans were people with their feet firmly on the ground, who worked to bring about a certain number of reforms. And quite evidently their reforms had a totalitarian side to them, because totalitarians seek to impose their discipline, their way of life, their precepts, the values they place in the forefront, the moral values which we would say are more aristocratic than democratic in our meaning of the word. Euh, euh, plus aristocratique que euh, démocratique au sens où nous l'entendons. Against the background of Plato's Republic, which is another famous model of a philosopher's political reform, how can we explain the model of the Pythagoreans? Did they too harbor the idea of forming an elite of Pythagorean politicians? <laughs> 
or did they really want to revolutionize things and create an entire city of Pythagoreans? Oui, je, je crois effectivement que les Pythagoriciens... I believe the Pythagoreans wanted to reform the entire city. They didn't just want the philosophers to take power on their own, with all the others living a more or less good life below them, like a lower order. No, each person had to become a full member of this order. And in Pythagoreanism there was a profound will in Pythagoras' speech, which goes back to Aristoxenes of Taranto, a profound wish to reform the family, and therefore not just political relations or a certain number of relations between the city and other cities, international relations as we would call them, but especially and mainly the ways of living between husband and wife father and son, mother and daughter. He had a complete whole, and this was why Pythagoreanism was something totalitarian, a way of completely managing the way of living and being in the world. Professor Ditien, how can we put together these two aspects whereby on one hand as you have explained, the Pythagoreans surrendered all their belongings and everything they had to the order. And on the other hand, they wanted the family as the basis of the state. What was their attitude towards the possession of goods? Oui, la, les biens. The goods possessed by the Pythagoreans went to the order, and the family was therefore nourished by the order, a system serving as the basis for the better known model of the Spartan world. There too, people ate together and had the right of a small surplus in order to feed their families, beginning with water, shared water. So, at one and the same time, we have this enhancement of moral values within the family, and the family's distance with respect to the wealth or the income which it might dispose of and to an entire part of what the Greeks called oikos, which was taken over and dedicated to this, well, yes, military organization in both cases, in Sparta as well as in the Pythagorean order, where the wish was to create a perfectly united city, just like an army corps. On the other hand, if I'm not mistaken, the distinction between an esoteric teaching and an exoteric teaching is also a Pythagorean distinction. It therefore seems that we still have a distinction between the rather closed circle of the Pythagoreans and what would be everyone else. How do you explain this? Hello. Well, in Pythagoreanism there actually was this religious dimension, this will to reorganize, to transform the city, which was the political plan. But there was also intellectual activity. The Pythagoreans were intellectuals, and intellectuals all the more dangerous because they had political pretensions and quickly fell into totalitarianism. Pythagoreanism stressed a certain number of intellectual disciplines, and here we are getting into the relationship between Pythagoras himself with some discoveries or inventions we would now call scientific. For example, the first developments in geometry, which are to be attributed more to Thales of Miletus. But Pythagoras came from Samos, and Samos was where a certain number of architects and geometricians who were able to resolve the complex problems of angulation built great works such as the system of aqueducts by Eupalinos, which was discovered much later. Therefore, there was this dimension of curiosity, reflection, and work on geometry. And by that, I mean work on abstract forms, on the forms in themselves. 
what can be done with a circle. This is an activity which formed part of the Pythagorean order. Then there was the work on number and numbers and considerations on the relations between letters and numbers, pebbles and numbers. Isn't this world made up entirely of numerical relationships? The third aspect of what we could call the Pythagoreans' intellectual curiosity had to do with music and the relationships created by the musical scales. So intellectual activities were cultivated by some of the Pythagoreans. Tradition tells us that in the Pythagorean order there were numerous degrees and likewise there were numerous stages in this initiation process, this teaching. One of the major dividing lines was the one traceable between the mathematicians, the people who dealt with mathemata, or the teachings later to become mathematics, and the acousmaticians. The acousmaticians were people who knew and practiced a certain number of Pythagorean precepts and who were second-degree Pythagoreans or in any case, Pythagoreans less intellectual than the others. We've spoken about the religious aspect, the aspect of the purification of the soul, of a certain withdrawal from the world. We've considered the political facet, the commitment in the real world. And now we've seen a third aspect, the scientific one. One feature of this latter aspect is represented by mathematics, and for that the Pythagoreans are famous. How can we reconcile the interest in mathematics with a political commitment? How could the Pythagoreans base their political programs on mathematical models? Well, in Pythagoreanism, there was this claim for the looking on without being involved. And one of the definitions, one of the first definitions of what is a philosopher was given, somewhat late it's been said, by Pythagoras. He took the example of the game, the Olympic game. The people who go to the Olympics belong to three categories. There are those who go to compete, to take part, and they are the athletes. The second category consists of the tradesmen, people who are there for the business, the empiricists who open market stands and make sure goods circulate. And then you have the third category. And here Pythagoras took an old name in order to give it a new meaning, made up of the ones who go to watch. That is to say, the cities send theoros to the game. Theoros from the verb meaning to watch, to observe. Theorem, which became theoretical. Therefore, according to Pythagoras, the philosopher is he who merely goes to observe and is not the wise one. He is not the sophos, but is the friend of sophia, of this wisdom which entails keeping one's distance in order to see how things are interrelated. And an entire part of the intellectual activity of Pythagoras, the philosopher, traditionally had to do with thinking about and reflecting upon musical chords, considering and meditating upon the way the stars revolved in the skies, and therefore analyzing a series of forms, which we would call abstract forms, and, of course, astronomic geometry. The astronomic geometry, which is mainly spherical, and at the same time, the linkages, where the algorithms of numbers play an essential role. In other words, could we say that the political world is linked to the rest of the world, to cosmology through music and mathematics, in the sense that mathematics reveals the laws of harmony to us?
In effect, this model cannot be attributed, as it stands, to early Pythagoreanism, but to the movement as it developed over nearly two centuries, that is, between 530, halfway through the 6th century, and, let's say, 450 or 430, in any case, during those two centuries. And, in fact, Pythagoreanism took this direction. It wanted the law to be in conformity with a certain mathematical order. And there is a whole series of Pythagorean treatises which were going to give us the arithmetical formula, the numerological formula as to what were the good laws of a city, and which state that between the world, the small world of the city, and the great world, for which the Greeks used the word cosmos, there have to be a close relationship. And music, particularly in the Pythagorean cities, this was to be cultivated by the theoreticians who were Plato's contemporaries. Music was to render the political education of man possible. The basic core, solemn music, Dorian music, were what were going to give man the rhythm, the way of being in the world with others that complies the most with the rules set by the cosmos in which we live. Therefore, the deciphering of the meaning of this number, the understanding that the number organizes the world, and that music is based on numbers, constituted one of the aims of the Pythagorean order. Through progressive scientific discoveries, which, historically speaking, are to be situated somewhat later than the beginning of Pythagorean activity. Remettre un peu plus tard que les commencements même de l'activité pythagoricienne. We have spoken about numbers and music. On one hand, it would seem that numbers are the foundation, the structure of music. On the other hand, we know that music, the chords, and the exact relations between sounds were the beginning of the mathematizing interpretation of the world specific to the Pythagoreans. For the Pythagoreans, therefore, what were music and numbers? According to the tradition handed down to us through Aristotle, the Pythagoreans were those who said, who sustained that things were numbers, that everything was made up of numbers. And the doctrine was explained and developed by a whole series of representatives of the Pythagorean school, and in particular by those who worked on the manner in which the form of each being reflected the form of a figure, and who speculated on the relations which could exist between numbers. So there was that vision of things. But there was also something else we know very well, and this is that the Pythagoreans and the Greeks in a general way were the heirs of all the thinking on numbers which came from the Eastern world, directly from Egypt in particular, a bit more remotely from Babylonia, and also from the world of Mesopotamia. So there were a whole series of acquisitions where numbers played an important role. But what was perhaps decisive for the credibility of Pythagoreanism was the confluence between this reflection on the relations between numbers and the numbers which are things, and the reflection on forms in the consideration of the geometry which passes through astronomy. In this case, music did play an important role. According to the claims of tradition, we do not have any very early evidence, the Pythagoreans are credited with having reflected on the different musical modes, on the nature and the composition of instruments, 
and also for having elaborated theories, enhancing the weight of a certain number of numbers, the importance of a certain number of figures in order to define the musical scale. Hence, reflection on music itself fell within the cosmic field which was opened up by the geometric astronomy in which the Pythagoreans were active, along with people like Anaximander, and all those who were to play an important role in work on the relationships between the unlimited and limited, between the peras and the aperon. L'illimité et le limité, le Péras et la Peyron. In his lectures on the history of philosophy, Hegel defended the Pythagoreans by sustaining that the greatness of the Pythagorean philosophy resided precisely in the fact that they saw the origin of the entire world's richness in the most abstract possible structure of numbers. Professor Dutien. Right behind you, there is a beautiful harp. We could very well imagine that numbers may be the fundamental structure for the sounds this harp is able to produce. And yet, must we also retain, as the Pythagoreans believed, that this same object is structured on the basis of numbers? Or would this only be true for the harmonies which can be created in music? The construction of musical instruments doesn't seem to have been done on the basis of a knowledge of numbers. All Pythagoreanism did on music was to conduct experiments and try things out, much like what was done by the early Pythagoreans on what we call basic geometry. Those were the first experiences, and not scientific theories at all. There are no mathematical formulae relative to a single musical instrument in any Pythagorean writing. There were relations between what we call and what they call an arithmology, considerations on numbers, on algorithms, and a certain number of laws or general propositions on how the musical chords were arranged with respect to one another. On the one hand, we have the numbers. We have spoken about numbers. On the other hand, you have referred to geometry. What did geometry mean for the Pythagoreans? Is there a relationship between arithmetic and geometry? Or are they two different aspects which are to be considered as such? Hello. Dans la tradition pythagoricienne, il y a un rapport étroit entre In the Pythagorean tradition, there was a close relationship between arithmology and geometry. There was an arithmogeometry, and therefore there was reflection not only on forms. Everything which can be thought and all the types of angles which can be conceived on the basis of perfect forms, like the circle, and on the other hand, this sort of materialism of numbers, which was one aspect of Pythagoreanism, later destined to take on the form of an arithmology. Numbers were given a sort of material density, whereby they were more real than things themselves. Not more real in the sense understood by mathematicians today, but somehow denser with substance than things can be. And in these writings, because Pythagoreanism is also a literature, a collection of writings, books and fragments of books, and there are some fragments which have come down to us from the Hellenistic age and are claimed to be the writings of Pythagoras, or dating back to an even earlier age. In these writings we see developed what we will find in the writings of Jamblichus and in a certain number of later treatises, a true arithmogeometry. And that is practically a scientific aberration, because it leads to mixing up things which do and must live separately. Let's move on to cosmology, to an aspect of the Pythagorean's theory 
and perhaps the broadest aspect of their explanation of the world. Could you explain for us how the Pythagoreans interpreted the structure of the world as a whole? The Pythagorean cosmology is first of all a cosmology which only dates back to the 5th century and which surfaced in works both true and false, a mixture of texts which seem ancient and others which seem not to be and are therefore attributed to Philolaos. Philolaos of Taranto was a mathematician as well as a theoretician of music and he was the one who proposed a sort of complete discourse on the world. There was an original place, which was made Earth, and was only a part of what rotates, of what circulates in the entire cosmos. Philolaeus's cosmology was therefore something where the principal foundation included the Pythagoreans' astronomic and geometric vision, but this time presented, in the way of narrating and expounding, specific to the rationality of the 5th and 4th centuries BC. In the field of music, the Pythagoreans certainly made some very important discoveries which I believe are still valid today. Can we say the same thing about cosmology? No, in the field of cosmology, no. Except perhaps for the fact that, along with Philodeos, they proposed a version other than the one centered upon the Earth. However, with respect, for example, to the liberty with which Anaximander conceived of space as unlimited, the Pythagoreans were much more traditional, much less original. Nor were they very original, or only so to a limited extent, in the area of basic geometry and in the field of the first numerological discoveries or in initial reflection on numbers. In effect, they probably did contribute, some of their representatives did play a role, to the development of a certain number of aspects in mathematics. But it is very difficult to turn Pythagoras himself into a great mathematician, or even to make him a great cosmologist. Perhaps one of the most famous Pythagoreans was Plato, because the encounter with the Pythagoreans was very important for Plato. In this sense, Plato was not only a Pythagorean, but was also a great mathematician. Could you tell us something about the importance of Pythagoreanism for Plato, and perhaps something about the transformation of the Pythagorean facet in Plato? Oui. Yes, Plato did have contacts with Pythagoreans who, I would venture to say, were in retirement or did not take part directly in any of the movements for the reorganization of the city. He knew them through exchanges between intellectuals in the Greek world and particularly through contacts in writing because geometry, for example, involves things which are drawn and therefore written down, and are likewise proved in writing. It is also evident that Plato was very tempted by the role of the philosopher, the philosopher who has his bearings and possesses sound reason, and, in addition, who perhaps has access to good. This was a person who had to and could be involved in bringing order into the world. As a result, Plato was very much attracted by Pythagoreanism, and in his works there are numerous references and allusions to Pythagorean teachings, to Pythagorean discoveries, but they have more to do with the Pythagoreans of his time than with the Pythagoreans of the first period. Also present in Plato, perhaps in the way he raises a certain number of issues, in the way some dialogues select this or that myth, this or that account which makes it possible to proceed further than reason, 
That is something which comes from the approach introduced into philosophy by the Pythagoreans. In other words, a discourse where there is geometry, where there is mathematics, but where there is also a sort of religious coloration, whereby the ultimate ends also become important, and perhaps even more important than the beginning and the ordering of the world. And it is slightly this coloration, this effective need to consider the end or the ends of man, and therefore to have this initial eschatological orientation, which is so strong in the myths of Plato, in his famous dialogues, which would refer us back to this mixture introduced by the Pythagoreans, to their way of philosophizing, by virtue of metamsomatosis. The Pythagoreans also attributed great importance to getting out of the chain of reincarnations, of knowing a sort of repose or end. And this was not something of immediate importance for the Greek city. The Greek city was not worried about the beyond. That didn't bother them. And the Greeks who lived in the cities were not concerned with what people told them about the immortality of the soul or what happened after death. The important thing was to live well together. Philosophers like the Pythagoreans and a philosopher like Plato added something more. It wasn't just a question of living well together, but a question of having a better life later on in the afterward. We've always spoken about Pythagoras in the plural, about the Pythagoreans. It was very important for the Pythagoreans to form a whole, almost a society. Therefore, there is also the matter of the unity and the plurality of the Pythagoreans in time. They founded a tradition which in a certain sense also included Plato. And to inaugurate a tradition, it is necessary to cultivate memory. Could you explain for us the importance of the concept of memory for the Pythagoreans? Yes, in the life discipline, the lifestyle of the Pythagoreans, and precisely through metamsomatosis and reincarnation, the concept of memory, or the exercise of the memory, very soon came to the forefront. The psyche, the soul, has a history which has gone through numerous stages. And each person who every evening makes an examination of conscience looks back and asks himself, what did I do today? Or where did I go? Who did I meet? Or what did I talk about? As the Pythagoreans did every evening, is someone who is exercising for himself this memory which then gives him access to a greater and more extensive memory, which is the memory of this trajectory, this itinerary traveled by his own psyche, his own soul, which brought him to where he is, an individual in this group, this heteria. For the Pythagoreans, therefore, memory became something very important and not only in the history of the later Pythagoreans, who, building up a library, reading and writing, were the heirs of a great tradition, but memory, as it would appear to have been organized very early by the Pythagoreans, perhaps by Pythagoras himself, in the form of a cult of the muses. A cult of the muses where the Pythagoreans included their own values of music, culture and intellectual life, but under the hallmark of a knowledge enriched by memory. A person knows himself by retracing his own history, by recognizing the way the world is constructed, is ordered. Hence, memory for the Pythagoreans was an excellent pathway, a pathway travelled both by the individual and by the intellectual disciplines they cultivated in common. If I understand correctly, memory has two functions, or two different aspects. One is the collective memory of the Pythagoreans, and the other is an individual memory with daily exercises as you have explained. <laughs> 
this seems quite revolutionary, since it is a type of reflection of the individual, of each person upon himself, which seems to be a precursor of that reflection of the subject upon himself, which later emerges among the sophists. Could we venture to assert that this represents a sort of forerunner of an existentialistic moment in personal self-reflection? The exercise of the memory practiced by the Pythagoreans was not practiced as a single subject, as an isolated individual, but as a person living in a community, obeying a certain number of rules and complying with the way of living together. In effect, each person had to do his own exercises, just as he had to do a separate physical, athletic or intellectual exercise but at the same time as the others. What I consider to be important in this work of memory is that the individual discovers within himself the way his own psyche is made. But this psyche is not the singular mark of an individual. The psyche, the soul, is the most anonymous, most shared, most widely spread thing there is. It does not relate to an individual subject. In effect, the Pythagoreans did something very original, something which the religious orders were to do later in a much stricter way in Christianity with the monastic rule. And that was to take the day, the 24-hour unit, and break it up into segments and to establish a sort of homology between each day and life. And say, as Seneca was to write in his letters to Lucilius, as the Stoics were to sustain, and what moralism was to reiterate, to say that a day well spent is worth an entire life. As a result, the art of organizing the day the art of managing the hours is a fundamental and necessary act of self-control, particularly in the perspective of a movement with an eschatological purpose. As a movement, the Pythagoreans had a history, and during this history, the theories of Pythagoras would have been developed, and there would have been changes. Could you briefly explain how Pythagoreanism developed and changed. Well, we can distinguish several periods in Pythagoreanism. The first period goes, let's say, up to around 450 BC and combines in rather nebulous terms a certain number of things. Geometry, works on mathematics, political activities and religious beliefs. Then, as of 450, let's say, and especially as of 410 BC, the political dimension disappeared completely. The Pythagoreans were thrown out of the main cities of southern Italy where they had been tempted to assume political responsibility. This is when we see the appearance of two types of Pythagoreans. On one hand, there was the friendly Pythagorean, this being tantamount to a disciple of Plato, or even Plato himself. These were the intellectual theoreticians who perhaps behaved in a particular way and lived in a separate way or still in small groups, but were not involved in political activities. These were the noble Pythagoreans, as we would call them. Then there were the Pythagoreans who were going to become like the cynics, who were going to appear in the comedies, in the Attic comedies, in the fourth century comedies like those of Ipia, as personages on whom there was basically only a certain way to be different from the rest, who evaluate and criticize culture and society, who were outsiders and who lived like outsiders. These Pythagoreans who lived on the fringes of society were to continue turning into cynics, 
or at least disappear in that direction. They were isolated figures. What we then see is a literature and a sort of library which brought together both active intellectuals, but also and especially texts, which were gradually going to attribute Pythagoras a series of discourses, reflections and inventions, at times in a very mediocre way in literary terms. Nonetheless, this library, this literature, and this Pythagorean way of writing was going to mark and influence the Roman Pythagoreans. Elle va euh, marquer, elle va colorer euh, le euh, romain. In Rome, with a certain number of people, such as Fulvius Nobilio, in the period preceding Cicero, interest in this political, philosophical and moral theory, along with a scientific background, was fashionable. And this literature was to catch on and enter into a series of practices, of places, and give life to texts such as the Dream of Scipio, which was made up of all these Pythagorean theories which were so fashionable in the Roman world. Moreover, Pythagoras was to become part of the literature of the exegetes, the hermeneutics, and those who were to interpret Plato. Et puis, effectivement, euh, Pythagore va entrer dans la littérature des exégètes, des herméneutes, de ceux qui vont interpréter euh, Platon. Puisque Because the great corpus of Plato's writings was soon to receive what we would call this neo-Platonic reading. And in the works of this great scholar, there was to be a place for Pythagoras for the writings of Pythagoras and for the literary and scientific traditions of the Pythagoreans.